With respect to the parts in common with beings of medium capacity that we're looking at now in the presentation of the stages of the path, the principal focus is to cultivate a thought of renunciation because this is the principal factor required for achieving liberation. Without the thought of renunciation, whether one be striving within the Shravaka, Pratyeka, Buddha, or Bodhisattva vehicles, one cannot achieve their respective enlightenments. So this attitude or thought of renunciation is an indispensable cause for liberation. And it's cultivated by thinking about suffering with respect to oneself, right? Primarily thinking about the suffering oneself experiences in samsara, then wishing to be liberated from that. One contemplates with respect to one's own experience, the eight types of suffering, the six types of suffering, and the three types of suffering that we have gone over so far in the Lam Rim. Right? So we contemplate it with respect to ourselves, not necessarily with respect to others, when the purpose is to cultivate renunciation, that is. So, for example, we think about all the different types of suffering that we might experience if we take birth and how unhappy and unpleasant that would be. And based on that, cultivate a wish to achieve liberation, right? This sense of renunciation, this weariness with suffering. And thus you meditate in that way, right? Meditation doesn't mean necessarily meditating on emptiness or a wisdom realizing impermanence, for example. Those are fantastic, but very difficult to cultivate for beginners, and those types of realizations are difficult to cultivate for beginners because these are antidotes. And in order to cultivate an antidote correctly, one needs to identify its opposite, right? The so-called discordant class that needs to be abandoned. So these attitudes of grasping at inherent existence or grasping at permanence are the discordant class in that case. And they exist with us all the time, right? 24-7, since beginningless time in Sansara, right? Like an ever-present boil. So cultivating antidotes to such things is really difficult for us right now, as you can imagine. So instead, right now, for a beginner, it's more pertinent to think about the suffering we experience day to day and at least identify that as suffering and then contemplate what is its cause and what are the methods to alleviate it and thus give rise to renunciation in this way and meditate in this way. Sorry, at the start of when Geshe was speaking, the internet cut out, but I think I can put it all together. So day to day, we're always experiencing suffering, but we don't necessarily identify it as suffering. And that's a big problem for us right now as beginners. One might think one's, one is happy because one doesn't have manifest physical suffering right now. But that's not required to state that we are actually suffering, right? There's suffering on a mental level that needs to be identified as suffering as well. So uh, a way to meditate on suffering could be to contemplate those in hospital or even go to hospital yourself and see with your own eyes the sort of suffering that's going on there, right? 
people experiencing all sorts of illness and even corpses being carried away. And one would think, I might be healthy now, but there's no guarantee that in the near future or distant future, I won't end up like that, be sick in this way, suffer in this way, and of course, die in this way. And yogis, for example, they would go to a cemetery to meditate on death and impermanence. All right, so the suffering experience that we're presently in is like being fried in oil. And where we so often go wrong is that we don't identify our happy feelings as suffering, right? Mistaking happy feelings as real happiness, we continue to accumulate karma and cycle within existence in this way. In the tantric treatises, it talks about utilizing implements made from human body parts as a method for recollecting death and impermanence. So for example, during certain rituals, the tantric practitioners will blow on a thigh bone trumpet right, made from a human thigh bone. Or the offering substances uh, will be placed in a skull cup, right, made from an actual human skull. So these have a very pertinent and effective purpose, which is for recollecting death and impermanence. Right, and you might have seen um, j practitioners or chud, as it's sometimes pronounced as blowing on these instruments. And of course, uh, these days they could be made out of anything. Um, some might even ornament them with gold or silver, but that would probably only serve to increase attachment when the actual purpose for them is a, a tool to recollect death and impermanence. Right, and likewise, uh, other methods are mentioned, like wearing the rags of deceased people and so forth for the same purpose. But the whole point is to remember that whether we're rich or whether we're poor, we all end up on the cremation pile and we'll all be burned or buried or whatever, disposed of in the end. And therefore, meditating on impermanence uh, or emptiness, you know, it's quite difficult right now, so better yet to recollect something that is so visible and obvious to us that we can really relate to, right? Like suffering and it leading to death. Suffering and death, rather. Less. Mm. When we think about what is good and what is bad, generally speaking, we're not looking to identify some external object, right? We're only thinking within our own experience. So with respect to ourselves and our own experience, what is good and what is bad can only meet back to happiness or suffering, right? When the Buddha gave teachings on what is preferred and what is not preferred, right? The good and the bad, he didn't say, go out and accumulate this type of object and get rid of this type of object that you might have, right? It wasn't anything like that at all. It entirely revolves around our own happiness and our own suffering. So within happiness, there are two types, temporary happiness and lasting eternal happiness. Now, temporary happiness we do have, we do experience that day to day. This is the contaminated happy feelings. But to achieve lasting eternal happiness, we need to identify that which is bad in our life, right? That which is undesired, which is suffering. The Buddha, in his very first teaching, said, This is the truth of suffering, for the purpose of us to identify suffering, 
right? As something within our own continuum, not something external, something that we need to learn how to identify. If this wasn't incredibly important, he wouldn't have taught that first, right? It's a profound fact that the Buddha taught suffering first. He didn't teach emptiness first, he didn't teach bodhicitta first, because all of those higher realizations rely upon identifying suffering first of all, right? Mm. In order for us to, rec to contemplate the paths that liberate from that and to understand that we need to ab abandon that completely. Therefore, it's incredibly important to cultivate a thought of renunciation, mm. right? One contemplates how oneself is tormented by suffering and thinks, if only I could escape or be liberated from this suffering. And then furthering that contemplation, one thinks there is liberation from that suffering, right? So that's a contemplation of suffering with respect to oneself that leads to renunciation. Contemplating suffering with respect to others leads to a thought of compassion, right? So when one thinks about others' suffering, one thinks, may they be free from their suffering. And that thought is compassion. It's really easy for us to say, oh, poor thing, when we see the suffering of others, right? That comes naturally, at least a verbalization that yeah we don't want to see others suffering, right? You see uh, an animal that's sort of decrepit and it's like, oh no, poor thing. And Geshe said, at least for himself, that sort of reaction is not really deeply rooted. Although, you know, he has a habit of reacting in that way and probably we're all quite the same in that respect. It's not a real deep compassion that we're giving rise to at those times. Because to give rise to a deep-seated sense of compassion requires a lot of reflection and meditation, right? For example, meditating on exchanging oneself and others and so forth. Otherwise, how could it be the case that one really gives rise to deep compassion? So we'll return to the text now, and I think Geshe just sent somebody off to collect his uh, essence of refined gold text because he doesn't have it in front of him. But we're going through the individual sufferings of the different categories of beings. So we, we're going through the individual sufferings of human beings in our last class, right? In particular, the eight types of suffering. So the eight types of suffering start with the suffering of birth, aging, sickness, and death. And when we're not currently experiencing either of those four, it's quite pleasant, isn't it? But the reality is that we're going to have to face them again. When the Buddha was a prince in his palace in Magadha, he was prevented from seeing these sufferings by his father, right? He tried to keep him happy so that he would not uh, renounce the princely life. But eventually, of course, the Buddha did come to see those aspects of suffering, of aging, sickness, and death outside the palace walls, and therefore realized that this is all without essence, and he renounced the worldly life. There are other great masters with similar stories, similar trajectories, right? Even the great master Atisha started life in a princely environment, but later saw everything like a prison and renounced the worldly life and went forth into homelessness. And also great masters like Shantideva, I believe. Genagi Kinshin Shiwatsu Suyinbe Shiwala, 
And great masters like Shantideva, for example, experience the same thing, seeing everything to be without essence and renouncing it all. Right? Understanding that our experience in samsara is one that is under the influence of the three poisons and just an endless cycle of suffering. Great masters such as this, and Geshla said, these are only ones that I've read about in the more famous biographies. Of course, there's so many more great Buddhist masters, right? In India, Korea, Tibet, for example, Milarepa, who saw the four sufferings, who understood them, contemplated them, and meditated upon them, and realized that everything is without essence, right? As they say in their treatises again and again, they contemplated in this way and achieved Buddhahood. So now we're up to the suffering of sickness. So we're at the one, two, third paragraph on page 18. Right, we finished off in the last paragraph with such are the sufferings of aging. Then reading on, it says, as well as the sufferings of birth and age throughout life, he must continually confront the sufferings of illness. When we're sick, it's quite obvious, right? Our face starts to look a little bit, you know, pale. Our expression changes and the people around us start to comment saying, hmm, they look a little bit off, right? We might start to cry and so on and so forth. And here it says, when the elements of his body fall out of harmony, his skin dries and his flesh sags. So in traditional medicine, uh, one's health is attributed to a balance of the elements which the body is comprised of, right? The elements of earth, water, fire, and wind. These comprise our coarse body, right? Not talking about our subtle body. So when the four elements are balanced, we're well. When the fire element, for example, becomes too strong, we become in a state of dis-ease. Or when the wind element is out of balance and too strong, things happen like you can't sleep well at night, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, reading on. Food and drink, usually so appealing, seem repulsive, and instead he must ingest bitter medicines and undergo unpleasant treatments like operations, moxibustion, acupuncture, and so forth. And normally we're happy to eat anything, right? But when we're sick, uh, suddenly they're not so appealing anymore, are they? And when we're healthy, we don't often even know where the, the closest hospital is, right? We don't even think about it. We think, oh, I'm, I'm not going to get sick, right? We don't even think of our future possibilities or eventualities. We don't know where the best doc doctors are even. And when we're not sick, of course, we avoid horrible things like needles, moxibustion, and so forth. But when the eventuality comes, we have to rely on these horrible things, in order to bring back a state of wellness. So reading on, um, should the disease be incurable, he experiences immeasurable suffering from fear, worry, and apprehension. And if the disease is fatal, he lives with death in front of his eyes. So reading down, we then touch on the suffering of death. The nine sufferings of death are a presentation that you can read in Tsongkhapa's treatise on the stages of the path. I guess there's not going to go into detail on these nine. But just to summarize, if you're born a human, you're born from the womb. And in a sense, you're born alone because your experience of intense suffering at that time is something that you have to experience alone. It can't really be alleviated by others. You have to experience it yourself. Likewise, when you go through the intermediate state in the bardo, 
you suffer alone. And when you die, you, in a sense, suffer alone. You might have a few friends or family around you, but there's only so much that they can do for you. We die due to all sorts of different causes. Some people take their own life. Some people die because they were stabbed. Some people eat something poisonous. Some people undergo horrible disease, which causes their death. Some people are beheaded. These causes, are death, causes of death are all due to our past karma. And the text says, thoughts of harmful deeds he commit committed during his lifetime causes his heart to fill with regret, and he recollects all that he has left undone. Right? One dies with regret. He understands that he soon must leave his body, friends, relatives, associates, possessions. His mouth dries, his lips shrivel, his nose sinks, his eyes fade, and his breath passes in gaps. Tremendous fear of the lower realms arises within him, though he does not wish it, he dies. So your breathing stops, and that is like the coarse death, and then your mind leaves your body, and that is officially, according to Buddhism, when you die. Then reading on, it touches upon the next three of the eight sufferings, which are the suffering of separation from cherished objects, uh, the suffering of meeting with what one does not want, and the suffering of not finding what we desire. So as we go about in life, we think, I hope my friends don't betray me, or I hope I don't meet with thieves or robbers and such things. But sometimes we do, and this is the suffering of meeting with what we don't want. With respect to the suffering of being separated from what we cherish, sometimes we have to leave our family, right? Our wives, husbands, spouses, our children. Even if for a short time, it can be a very sad experience for us, right? The suffering of separating from what we cherish is an obvious one that everybody experiences in our societies. Then the, the seventh, the suffering of not finding what we desire is perpetual because we can never fulfill our desires, right? By their nature, desires are just simply unfulfilling, unfulfillable. For example, a businessman not getting his expected outcome Farmers, when they plant their crops, they're affected by rain, hail, wind, and so on and so forth. Again, let the bitch do this my lawyer be. So I guess this um, quickly reading down the text and uh, just summarizing the meaning. So I'll let you guys read it yourself. But essentially, in this paragraph, we're covering the fifth, sixth, and seventh sufferings. And then it finishes with, uh, he may become a monk, but one day he may have to face the sorrow of having broken his vows, right? That's a suffering that monastics can undergo when they don't keep their discipline as well as they expected themselves to. And then in the next paragraph, it concludes with the eighth of the eight sufferings, right? The suffering of all pervasive suffering of the aggregates that we carry with us. So I'll read it. In short, having taken a samsaric human form under the force of karma and afflictions, you must face the sufferings of birth, sickness, old age, death, and so forth. As well, you use your precious life, precious human life, largely as an instrument to produce more causes of lower rebirth and for greater misery in the future. All right, so this is the eighth suffering. It's the suffering of the five aggregates. From beginningless time, we have taken rebirth with these contaminated, appropriated aggregates, and they are the basis for all suffering we experience. When we die with these aggregates, even if we may be reborn a god, 
in the lifetime of a god, we undergo suffering still. And then as a god, you die. And because you've probably wasted your lifetime, used up your merit, you take reborn rebirth as an animal, for example, and then go on to experience endless suffering again. And thus you cycle in this way. Less, less. Okay, so... I was just clarifying because it was getting a bit tricky for me. Geshe was saying, we need to make a distinction between true sufferings and what we call suffering. So true sufferings can be divided into the suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and all pervasive suffering. And the first two, the suffering of suffering and the suffering of change, we most generally posit as feelings. Right In the treatises, they're also including within that their associated minds and the objects that they perceive. But in the general sense, we posit those as the suffering feelings. But true sufferings, generally speaking, aren't necessarily a suffering feeling. Right, included within the so-called true sufferings is the external environment that is also produced due to afflictions and karma. Right. So although they do uh, cross over, we're not saying that true sufferings and sufferings are completely different things, right? They have shared common locuses or common loci there are differences between them, right? True sufferings are a bit more comprehensive or embracing, right? They also include the external environment. But what we call suffering is generally narrowed down to the feelings of suffering. That was a bit tricky. Mm. Again, no? These eight sufferings in this presentation have been applied to a human birth. And you're not supposed to contemplate them with respect to others. This is a contemplation that you apply to yourself, right? You think about the eight sufferings with respect to yourself. And these mostly, not all of them, come up day to day, right? Of course, the suffering of death will come later, but the rest are naturally, naturally present. The contemplation or meditation on the eight sufferings is something you should take into your daily life, like reflect on your daily experiences and also do what's called like glance meditation or reflection meditation where you briefly bring to mind all of these topics like the suffering of sickness, suffering of death, suffering of aging, right? Briefly bring them to mind and reflect on them. And these meditations are said to help with one's resilience with respect to these sufferings. They don't make one become despondent and unable to handle the facts, but instead they are renowned to giving rise to resilience with respect to the individual sufferings that we need to contemplate. Here they are applied to the three happy rebirths, right, of a person, demigod, and a god. In the context of the paths shared in common with beings of smaller capacity, the motivation in that context was, if only I could take a higher rebirth as a god, for example. But it's not quite right to aspire to be reborn as a god. It's not the most ideal rebirth. Of course, if you practice the ethics of abandoning the ten non-virtues, you are going to take rebirth in one of the three higher realms. But within those three, if you are reborn as a god, it's not ideal for achieving liberation and omniscience. It's not ideal for practicing the three types of ethical training. It's not ideal for taking on monastic vows or tantric vows, right? 
for these trainings, one needs to take rebirth as a human. That is the ideal rebirth. So reading down in the text, in the realm of the demigods, beings suffer from constant fighting, killing, and wounding each other. So these demigods or asuras are said to live around the periphery of Mount Meru, but below the ocean surface. They're said to be neither gods nor human, hence why they're called demigods or non-gods, more literally. And Geshla said, well, you know, never seen one, but because the Buddha said that they exist, uh, just going on a basis of faith, we'll, you know, agree that they probably exist. So their experiences are not exactly like that of human beings, right? They don't fight our types of wars, but they most certainly, according to the scriptures, are engaged in fighting and quite often. And their fighting is horrible for them because they always lose. So they have that physical suffering of being wounded and killed in battle. And they have extremely strong mental anguish because they are always jealous of the gods, right? Who are above them, who are superior to them in all aspects of wealth, life, and so on. So, in the sutra of the four close placements of mindfulness, it actually categorizes them as animals, right? Not as gods. And then in I think uh, the the Yoga Chara Bhumi text, it categorizes them as gods, right? So it's interesting to note that there are also different presentations of what these beings actually are fundamentally. Although the demigods might be really smart or really wise, it is said in the scriptures that they do not give rise to bodhicitta or compassion and that they cannot realize reality or see the truth. And therefore, because they are said to not give rise to bodhicitta or see the truth of reality, it's not ideal to take rebirth as a demigod, right? It's not worth it to take rebirth in their state. It's much better to be reborn as a human being who does give rise to bodhicitta and can see reality. So reading down in the text, the second paragraph still after the title, The Three Sufferings. Above that, in the realm of the desire gods, when the five signs of oncoming death manifest, the beings suffer more than do the hell denizens. As their splendor fades and they are shunned by other gods, they know boundless mental anguish. So here it says, in the realm of the desire gods. And of course, this isn't just one abode. There are many, many, many different abodes within the, the realm of de desire gods, right? There's the land of the 33, and uh, God, there's, there's a whole list of the different heavens, right? Um, what is it? Utilizing others' emanations, right? They're very long names. But what's common to all of them are these signs of oncoming death that happen towards the end of their life, right? And it's said that approximately seven days before they die, these, these signs come, right? These omens of death. And these omens are, for example, with respect to the five distant signs of death, the luster of their body fades. They no longer want to sit on their thrones, their flower garlands that they wear start to wilt, right? Get old. Their clothes start to take on stains, right? Where they didn't before. And their bodies start to sweat, right? Which hasn't happened to them before. So this terrifies them because they know what's coming. And not only that, they're in this state of anguish, but all the gods around them start to shun them, right? They don't want to be around these people, or these gods rather, that are exhibiting these terrible signs. And so they suffer even more because of that, because everybody is avoiding them. Loss again. 
So when we say that these sufferings are experienced in all realms of the desire gods, that doesn't mean every single god will undergo such experiences. And that's because among the gods, of course, there are those that are bodhisattvas who have achieved the path of seeing. There are those who are non-returners, right? These signs of impending death that cause all this suffering are taught with respect to gods that are ordinary beings, right? So reading down, still higher in samsara are the gods of the form and formless realm. So now we're getting out of the desire realm and talking about the two higher realms. The text says, although they do not experience the suffering of immediate pain, those of the first three levels have the suffering of transient pleasure, and those of the fourth level of the formless those of the fourth level of the form realm and those of the formless realms levels must endure all pervasive suffering, which is likened to an unruptured boil. So here it's talking about form realm, which we can divide onto four main levels, within which there are said to be 17 abodes in total. So again, in the form realm, you have a multitude of different abodes where the gods can live. So those, and of course, those in the formless realm don't get these signs of impending death, right? They only apply to gods of the desire realm. But what they do still have is suffering because they have all pervasive suffering, the third type. They have all pervasive suffering because they still have com appropriated contaminated aggregates, which will project a further rebirth in samsara, right? So although their suffering of suffering might be absent, right? They don't have manifest suffering. And instead, they might have the suffering of change, right? Here it's called transient pleasure in the text. Or if they don't have transient pleasure, they're on because they're on an even higher level of meditation, they're in the fourth level of the form realm or any levels of the formless realm, they only have neutral feelings, but still these are all pervaded by all pervasive suffering. So since we're on the topic of desire realm gods, Geshe said I'd like to share with you a story from the sutras about one such desire realm god who experienced these sufferings of impending, the signs of impending death. So he was a Devaputra in the land of the 33, right? The heaven of the 33. And his name, I believe, was Drida Mati. And he started to get the signs that he's going to die in one week, right? So, of course, he was extremely upset. And Duridamati went to the great god Chakra and said, I'm experiencing, experiencing these signs and I know that suffering is coming. What can I do? And Chakra, the god Chakra said to him, well, unfortunately, I can see that if you die, you're going to take seven horrible rebirths as animals, right? As a dog, a pig, a monkey, and so forth. And then when you finish those births, you're going to go to hell for a hundred years. And then when you finally come out of hell, you're going to be reborn as a really destitute, poor human being. So it wasn't exactly the best news for this god, Dridamati. So still in mental anguish, Chakra on his behalf asked the Buddha, right? This Devaputra is undergoing this suffering, seeing his impending death. Is there anything that can be done? And the Buddha radiated light rays from the Ushnisha at the crown of his head. And that light pervaded the three realms, circled, returned back. And then the Buddha taught a mantra which he said the Devaputra must recite for these seven days. And through reciting this mantra for seven days, his 
lifespan was extended and he didn't have to undergo all these terrible sufferings. So of those sufferings of the fourth level and the formless levels must, sorry, those beings of the fourth level and the formless levels must endure all pervasive suffering, which is likened to an unruptured boil. Think about these general and specific sufferings of the various realms of samsara and then strive in every way possible to attain nirvana, right? So in our studies of the paths shared in common with beings of medium capacity, we've mostly looked at the first two noble truths, true sufferings and their origins. And through doing so, we are supposed to be generating a motivation to abandon these two and achieve liberation. It's not enough to merely listen to this presentation of Lamrim, right? We need to contemplate it. We need to meditate on it, right? So looking at the four truths, apply these sufferings that have been explained to yourself, contemplate their origins. What are causing these? Understand that this is your situation, right? Don't think about others. This is your situation that you're undergoing. You need to decide that you are going to abandon these sufferings. Because if you just give up and decide to experience them, you're essentially wasting your precious human rebirth, right? So at the very least, you need to bring this presentation into your practice, right? Don't just listen to the explanation and leave it be. Contemplate it, meditate on it. As you can see, the golden rosary that we're following is, golden rosary, sorry, essence of refined gold that we're following is an extremely condensed and brief text, right? This presentation here of the paths shared in common with beings of medium capacity is really, really short. And it doesn't include the presentation of the 12 links of dependent origination. In the more fleshed out presentation in Tsongkhapa's great treatise on the stages of the path, you do find the 12 links, right? In the outline, the methods for achieving liberation, it presents the four noble truths and the 12 links. So to make this a more complete presentation of the paths shared in common with beings of medium capacity, we will go over these 12 links and we'll start to look at them in the next class.